Yeah, I do want to uh, go ahead and get this started and thank everyone for joining us this afternoon for another uh, Mason Means Business webinar series. Today is going to be a topic that I've been looking forward to for several weeks now. We're going to discuss uh, this crazy working environment that we're all now living in, this, uh, the, the remote working revelations, uh, what's working, what's not working, uh, and then what should we not take away from this? Because I think there's going to be some lessons to learn, but lessons that we should probably forget as soon as this is over. Um, really excited for this one. We have three amazing panelists, uh, two from Corporate World and then one of our uh, professors of management. We'll get to their introductions shortly. Uh, do you just want to provide a little bit of an overview about this Mason Means Business series? Uh, many of you uh, looking at the registration list, you have come to some of these in the past. So I really appreciate that you've continued to support this. Uh, this endeavor started in the beginning of April when we, as a university, as a school of business, as executive development, uh, really wanted to provide content that we thought was timely and important and spoke to issues that really a lot of Mason faculty care deeply about. And so with that, we have been going now uh, for several weeks with a, a great series of content. Um, all of our webinars, uh, re we record them and they're available for consumption after the fact on YouTube. If you go to the Mason Executive Development YouTube page, you can listen to all of our previous uh, webinars as well as some other content that we've developed. Uh, we've had them on government contracting and the Defense Production Act, uh, business continuity, cybersecurity, smart investing if you want to know what to do with your, your portfolio right now. Uh, last week, we just did the Small Business Lending, the CARES Act, and the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, we had a panel of financial experts from executives from the banking industry really great content, you know, trying to provide service uh, for the Mason community and for, for members in the capital region. I do want to plug three upcoming webinars that we have in the, in the next few weeks. Next week, we're going to be joined by a few CHROs, Chief Human Resource Officers, who are going to be going through what they see as the major professional skills uh, that you need to continue to develop in this virtual environment. Uh, how do you behave? How do you operate yourself? How do you present yourself in the best light uh, to wow your bosses? Uh, we're also going to be doing what is similar to today's talk, but we're doing it in partnership with the Center for Real Estate and Real Estate Development and Entrepreneurship on the future of the office and office spaces. And we're doing this in concert with the International Federation of Facility Managers, IFMA, uh, where we're going to talk about to take a lot of that physical view of how the office is going to change after this. Uh, and that's May 27th and encourage you uh, all to sign up. And then lastly, we're going to have, uh, we have several panelists from uh, a large, one of the large uh, tax or accounting consulting firms, a mid-sized uh, consulting tax consulting or accounting firms, and a small one to talk about the corporate tax implications of the CARES Act and what firms need to know as they, they start to file their taxes in, in Ju uh, July, I believe. So with that and kind of a quick overview of, of these webinars, let me once again provide an introduction for me if, if you don't know me. Uh, my name is Brett Josephson. I am the Director of Executive Development at George Mason University, also an Assistant Professor of Marketing in the School of Business. Uh, and so these, let me get to uh, one thing, I, it's somewhat a, a, an action item or a request for those in the audience. This is something that my office, uh, advancement and alumni relations and the university as a whole is starting to explore is a summer masterclass series on about two weeks worth of content. We're thinking about 10 hours in relevant areas. And we've kind of picked a few of you see on the screen, data science, cybersecurity, and cloud management where these courses would be available for Mason alumni and the local community so that you could learn a relevant skill from Mason faculty in two weeks in online content that allows you to revise or upskill or reskill your resume so that you can kind of survive or thrive or change jobs in this uh, challenging job market right now. Um, you know, Steven is a CEO, he can probably speak to this at the very end of the, of the lecture, but if you're in the audience right now, if you're in attendance, please reach out to us at Executive Development, reach out to me, Brett Josephson. Um, I would love to know what you thought, what you think about these topics, topics you'd like to have covered, um, this is something that we're going to be pushing out really heavily in the next couple of weeks uh, and being supported once again by my office and advancement and alumni relations. We're really looking forward to it. We think it'd be a real uh, value add, especially to alumni. 
With that, I want to introduce our three amazing panelists. Um, I've gotten to know all three of these gentlemen, for Matt and Stephen for several years, for Carlos for about the last year, I think, Carlos, since we've started engaging. Um, so first, Car uh, Carlos Valdez de Pena, um, author, consultant, uh, motor or speaker. He's the CEO and founder of Corporate Collaboration, uh, used to be involved with Mars for, for several years, an executive at Mars. Uh, and has written several books on collaboration, teamwork, really a thought leader in this space. Uh, next, I want to introduce Stephen Lee. Uh, Stephen is the CEO and founder of Rotunda Solutions. Rotunda is a very innovative data science consulting firm that, that advises uh, upper level federal government, primarily in the Defense Department and a little bit in commercial on the use of effective AI solutions and in data science. Um, Stephen and I have been involved with several projects, uh, most notably the, the DIB, Defense Innovation Board, in their SWAB study. Um, lastly, I want to introduce Matt Cronin. Uh, last but certainly not least, Matt. Uh, Matt is an Associate Professor of Management, um, one of the best guys we have in the, in the, in the school, so that's why we, we joke a bit. Um, Matt is, is a real expert in the area of collaboration, creativity, teamwork, uh, written several books on the topic and is one of the leading scholars in the world on these areas so really excited to have both of them or all three of them on the panel so uh, gentlemen welcome thank you thank you all right so the first question and if you are wondering yes that is a picture of matt from his phd days at carnegie mellon um no it, it, it's not but really what what i wanted to get started with today's uh topic and to have you guys talk to each other um, and Carlos, maybe you can get us started on this one, is sure. if we just step back and we look at the last eight weeks of kind of the bulk of organizations moving to, to remote working, teleworking environment, shifting their, their organizational structure. As you've looked at this and if we've all kind of seen what's happened, what are some major takeaways at that 30,000 foot view that you've seen? So the biggest takeaway for me at this point, and I'm sure there's more than one, but it's amazing how quickly we can adapt to a situation when we have to. So I was working with Mars's internal IT group three or four years ago, and we were in conversations about building internal collaboration capability and, and doing more virtually. We were actually trying to drive out hundreds of millions of dollars from Mars's travel budget, right? And it was clear to us that, and this was just, again, two or three years ago, that the the technological capability could enable us to do a lot of that. And I felt like I was pushing water uphill, trying to get the IT group to try to move faster on some of this stuff. Well, along comes the coronavirus, and within a matter of weeks, they've taken the time frame for implementing, in this case, Microsoft Teams, from 18 months to three weeks. Um, and, and that has to do with obviously responding to the need. Um, I'm hearing from people that because they're working in the way they're working, they're making decisions more rapidly. Um, but it, it, it is stunning to me, stunning to me how amazing, that's a big infrastructure move for a company like Mars that's got 120 plus thousand people, right? But they did it. There's a kind of crisis agility that, that, that I'm seeing that's, um, startling it's impressive you have to scratch your head a little bit and say well it's not like we weren't talking about this for two years right um and so it's all sorts of those things it's quite a mixed bag in terms of my reactions to it but i think that's been my my the thing when i think about it that's left me most impressed and uh and well i just impressed quite frankly I think it's kind of funny if if uh, if I can jump in the it, it reminds me of uh, so one of the things in design that that has sort of grown in prominence is this sort of fail fast movement right, right. Which, you know again started uh, Carnegie Mellon has a lot to do with it, the beginning of that and where the the people realize that you can think you understand how something is going to work but you really don't get it until you try it. And then hopefully you see what worked, what didn't, you correct it, you move on and you try it again. And so, you know, it's almost as though 
we had been talking, we, the Royal way had been talking about all of the things we should be doing and maybe we could do this, maybe we should do that. But now that we've done it, hopefully we can iterate, right? We can sort of say, Oh, okay, well that was better. That was worse. Mm -hmm. You know, let's, let's tweak, let's fix, let's try this a different, a different way. You know, I mean, and anyone who's, as school aged kids who are being, you know, schooled at home know that some places are doing that well and some less well. Yeah. I, I think Stephen would be curious to, to, to recommend is both you have an experience for your companies of, of your company of what you've learned with your employees, but you also have had a lot of exposure to the different industries of both government and in the commercial sector. And I wonder if you can kind of add to that from kind of what you're seeing in major takeaways. And even let's start with from the government side with your major customers um, in terms of this this kind of crazy last two months. Sure. Yeah. So we've we've had an interesting vantage point, uh, both from the perspective of observing our own employees and looking at our partners and, and seeing how uh, listening to some of the stories they've been sharing uh, and certainly looking at these very, very large uh, federal entities um, and and small to medium to large size clients and, and how they have uh, in turn adapted. And to Carlos's point, the agility with which uh, they've adapted to a lot of these remarkable changes has, has been quite impressive. Um, as a firm that really looks a lot of times at behavioral analytics, um, it's an interesting social experiment. And I say that with caution. Um, the circumstances are terrible and, and we're surrounded and in many cases personally affected by, by tragedy. Um, but one outcome is that this is forcing many organizations to reassess things like their readiness, their workplace policies, um, their, their technological capabilities, their security, uh, things we've taken for granted uh, for years uh, as far as social contact, our, our daily rhythm throughout our day, you know, the coffee breaks, the, the lunchtime milestone that, that keeps me on track. And, and helps me to gauge out the rest of my day. These things are now gone. Uh, as we're deprived of these things, I think we start to realize, you know, the impact of some of these, the lack of social cues throughout the routine of our day. Um, and the, our reliance on technology, our reliance on being able to walk over to another office and, and knock on a door. Uh, a lot of these things are, are really being revealed. Um, our complacence is being revealed. Uh, and to Carlos's point, our, our agilities, uh, especially being, being revealed. Uh, but what we look at is more, yes, we have adapted. Um, and yes, we've seen this emergence of, of, uh, of companies uh, behaving differently, right, uh, to, to survive, of employees taking on different behaviors, in some cases because of scrutiny, right? Because you're getting to test out, uh, you're the guinea pig for a remote policy now. And arguably, you are incentivized to be especially diligent during this phase, knowing that eyes are on you. Is that gonna last? And that's really what I'm getting at. I, I wanna know what, what subpopulation of these changes will actually carry forward into the future. When we, when we presumably return to a, a more normal state um, and, and some population of our, our workers remain remote, uh, what, what carries over, right? What, what variables have changed? Um, if you do go back to a workplace, uh, especially in the federal sense, you go back to a workplace, there's still going to be standards. You may be wearing a mask. Your desks may be spaced apart. You may be restricted on, on meeting types uh, and frequency. There are effects that will carry over, and then there are certain things that will be removed. I'm working from home right now and, and constantly looking up at the door uh, to make sure my little ones don't rush in. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, when things return to quote unquote normal, when I am at home, I, I don't have that factor anymore. That variable has been removed. Uh, so I, I am very curious uh, to see what is coming around the corner. And you'll notice I'm sort of dodging that question that you originally posed in the sense of what am I seeing? Um, it's because I, I'm hesitant to throw something out there that is a temporary uh, state of being, right? This is something that, that may be phased out in four months. Yeah, we're going to get to our, our last question is going to be that kind of where, you know, where do we see it going and what should not be taken away. But Carlos, it looked like you had some of your going to try to chime in there. I really want yeah, to see you. I, listening, listening to Steve, I, I, I had a debate with a colleague today and uh, it all arose from a comment one of our other colleagues made about the 
the sudden need for everybody to work remotely has been in many respects, a great equalizer. So my boss isn't looking over my shoulder anymore. Um, we are all operating under the same handicaps. We are operating remotely. It's, it's almost like we've knocked a couple levels out of the organization because supervision doesn't look the way it used to look anymore, right? right. Um, and that may have implications for leadership going forward. And um, I have to be careful here because I don't want to get into our final conversation. But I, first of all, I was struck by this idea of re re technologically enabled remote working as an equalizer. I think it's a very powerful and real phenomenon. I'm hearing it in, in different words from all over the place. Um, people are getting more done. People are being very productive. People are enjoying having more time with their family and spending less time on the road. Everybody's getting the same benefits and everybody's paying the same psychological costs during this pandemic and this isolation. So I love that concept. I think we'll talk later, I will tee this up now, about will that have a lasting impact on leadership style? It's a really interesting question and I have, not, not surprising to you and, and, and Matt, I have strong opinions <laughs> about what might, might, what might or might not be the case there, but I love that thought of the great equalizer. I think that's worth uh, noting as a takeaway. Right. I, I do think impact is is different for, and we've certainly seen this when we, we take a survey of our clients and then a survey of our company and partners. Um, I think that for those of us, or some of us in the in the tech sector, uh, we're a little more predisposition to um, to thrive in this environment, right? Uh, to some degree, you might say we we might attract a certain type of uh, personality or predilection for a certain type of work arrangement. Um, sometimes we foster it, and, and many times. Uh, certainly, we're more conditioned to thrive in in this sort of remote state, right? A lot of our work happens to be remote, and so for some of us, this is the norm. Um, we we have project structures in place. Uh, if if you're on a an agile, more agile, formal software development structure, you know you've got points, you've got a schedule, you've got a pacing of meetings. So this really, I see uh, a lot of companies that are just pushing forward and saying, "Hey, this is not a big deal." Uh, contrast that with some of our federal customers who have what are called core hours. Everybody shows up at the same time. There is a very heavy emphasis on being available, physically available, right? Being physically visible to, uh, to your, car, your point, Carlos, uh, to your supervisors. You know, you've got the, the, the government supervisor in an office and out the door she can see her, uh, her farm of cubicles and see what everybody's doing, right? And she can call out. So things like that, I think, are quite clearly more impacted. And so how do you recreate that in a virtual environment? It's, it's a lot tougher, right? Um, and in some ways, I, I have heard uh, quite a bit that some of these managers are actually less productive in a sense. Because suddenly, whereas before it was an office and a door and a cube farm, and individuals would trickle in throughout the day and it would be paced and the interactions would be measured and time boxed. Now that everyone's virtual and we've got these virtual forms of communication, these people are being inundated with emails, <laughs> instant messages, uh, you know, Slack messages and, and texts and calls and really getting sworn because they don't really have an internal way of, or they don't have some uh, a personal or administrative way of, of catching all this and, and sorting through it and prioritizing it. So that's one huge impact that, that we've seen um, as far as the shift to teleworking, and that's sort of coming from the other side. Certainly there's, personally, I, I love it. I love not having to commute two hours into DC. Um, it makes my day so much better, um, and arguably it makes me more productive because uh, those hours somehow translate to me still sitting at my desk, right? So it's not that I'm getting up four hours early. Um, that's four more hours you're getting out of me because um, I lose track of the day. But these other groups, um, especially in the federal side, and certainly I'm not making a blanket statement for all our federal customers. I have heard quite a bit of, of chatter um, that it's much more difficult. I think though, I'm, I wanna caution all of us because one of the, th like, you know, in, in our last webinar, we talked about prognostication, right? Of what will happen. I don't think we, I don't think the data are in. I think we can find experiences of ac across people about some things that are good and some things that are bad. And, and for me, the wise company doesn't 
start interpreting that data. They start asking more questions in a more controlled environment, right? Now that we are back and we have actually a comparison and not just a, an emergency reaction, right? Does, you know, do people, I mean, just to, to be very plain, right? I wonder, like in my world, people, a lot of people thought the future of education is online. And a lot of people have been disabused of that notion now, right? Um, I think a lot of us think about, oh, I'd love to, if I could telework more often, you know, I totally would. Now, many people think, you know, I, I could use some space from, you know, I could use some psychological distance, right? So it's really important that we sort of gather our information from, from this weird test case and elaborate on the lessons we believe we've learned. And also, again, hear the voices from across the different people, right? So the interesting, the equalizing, right? Like, you know, like this, is maybe somebody who is not being observed thinks this is great. Now I can get left alone and do my own work. And again, maybe now the manager is thinking, oh my God, I need some help. Or I need to like corral these people so they're not just feeling like they can pull my toe anytime they want an answer, right? Like there's a lot that we need to sort of learn. This is helping us, this pandemic is helping us understand the questions we should be asking, I think. No, that I think that goes to a lot of uh, points and to to plug the podcast that Matt and Carlos and I just did. You can download it on Apple, Spotify, Google. We went into a lot of these issues and, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about, you know, what does it mean from this kind of esoteric view of what's the office and the purpose of the office. And I think what came out of this recent conversation, I just, you know, we'll make this point, we'll move on to the next question. But, you know, I, I think that idea of there's probably a bifurcated view of are you the employee or are you the manager? And this remote work teleworking is going to have different effects. And I think, Stephen, you made a point, and Carlos, you echoed it. You know, my mailbox is significantly fuller than it was before this event. Uh, my, my days are more filled with meetings, with Skype meetings. And it just seems because you've lost the transaction cost, even of just having to walk across campus for a meeting, you schedule more in a day than you normally would have, right? You're just, you're just right there and doing it. So... With that, I, I want to um, not necessarily shift gears, but I want to try dive deeper uh, into a couple more of our topics, and specifically ones that I know that everybody on this panel is very uh, both passionate about and then experts on. So we've had this move towards the, the remote environment. It's been forced upon us. It's an exogenous shock that's forcing this. Uh, but I want to talk about collaboration and teamwork. And so now we're doing it where, Carlos, you spoke very eloquently on this in the podcast, I thought, that at Mars, who had really revolutionized this idea of an open office decades before it was common. That the point was to have, you know, accidental um, contact with each other, you know, or, you know, you, you, you had these, this ecosystem where you'd bump in and it would foster collaboration. It, it would create an environment of teamwork. Now that's gone and we're remote and we're living in a 2D world. So both talk about collaboration and I, I, for the panel, what do we do as managers or employees to ensure we're getting the same level or as close as we can to the same level of collaboration and teamwork across our organization. I'll, I'll jump in. What's interesting to me in talking to clients and colleagues is not only has productivity gone up by some measures as much as 40%. And I just saw this a couple of days ago in a, an HBR piece, I think. So not only has productivity gone up, but contact throughout the day seems to have gone up. Now I'm talking, Steve, here about old line companies like Mars, like AP Muller Maersk, companies I work with, where for some reason the, the felt need to stay connected is driving people to be in touch more. I want to caution that being in touch is not the same as collaboration because it, it ain't the same, right? We have social needs and being social is not the same as collaboration. But the, what I'm hearing from people, clients as, as well as colleagues, is that folks are finding collaboration almost easier to do, um, in part because, uh, and this is an overarching theme, many of my clients are still in crisis mode. They are still responding to this as a new thing. So they are being more, I hate this word, proactive, right? But they're, they're still, they're trying to make sure they don't mess up. So they're staying in touch more. They're trying to make sure there are no gaps. They're trying to make sure they figure this out and get it right. They haven't settled in yet 
to what I would consider to be a mentally and emotionally healthy and stable, sustainable way of working remotely with each other, right? Um, it's, it's interesting for me to see. I mean, so you're getting more, you're getting more contact. You're, I think that contact is actually more productive. So this whole thing about collisions in the open office, in my experience, and I think there's probably some research to support it, doesn't necessarily lead to anything, right? It's just people bumping into each other and maybe even distracting one another. But this is different. These are intentional points of connection done virtually in order to make sure nothing falls through the cracks. I think it's really, really quite remarkable. I don't think it's sustainable, but again, no, pro no prognostication today. But that crisis management attitude people have, I just think is, a, is difficult to sustain over the long term. I, I, I look forward to seeing what happens when that um, crisis mentality subsides and people fall into something more like a pattern and a rhythm, something they can maintain over time. That leads me to my next and, and final point your to answer to this question. Um, the, 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 the bonding that happens among people, especially people who don't know each other well, and that is facilitated by being in a space together, right? That really can't happen in two dimensions, right? That, if you've worked with people over time, you know them well, great. You can do a lot remotely and you can stay pretty connected remotely. To the degree that people are new to working with each other, haven't got strong relationships, we have to start thinking about how we, how we do that, how we build human connection when we don't have human contact. That's the, so the book I, I just wrote, and sorry for the blatant plug here, but it's, it's called Virtual Teams, Holding the Center When You Can't Meet Face-to-Face, -face, is all about how we might do that, how we might do something. It won't be a perfect facsimile, Right. In fact, no, it won't be a perfect replica. It'll just be a facsimile of the face-to-face -face kind of connecting. But, uh, but, but there, there are things we can and should start think about, thinking about doing to help with that interpersonal connection. And look, I don't think it's as simple as getting on a call and asking how your day went or doing an icebreaker question. It's, it's got to be deeper than that. Yeah. Uh, so long, long answer to a pretty straightforward question. Uh, Gentlemen, Matt, Steve, what do you think? Uh, so to Matt's point about not prognosticating, I, I fully, I fully uh, agree. You know, you, you don't want to speculate. Um, and like we said earlier, we don't know what, what features of the now are going to really carry over to four months, to six months, et cetera, et cetera. And if anything, we've shown that the workplace is a dynamic entity. It continues to adapt and change. Uh, as, as measures are lifted, we're going to adapt to that. Specifically when it comes to Teamwork and, and collaboration, uh, I think Carlos, you bring up a great point about sustainability. Um, yes, we can put measures in place now. How do we make sure that that, that really, how do we know that that's something that's going to carry over? How do we know that that is something that's going to integrate into the new culture, right? The, the culture we have down the road. Um, I think the best we can do, and I'm speaking from a from the standpoint both of a, a, press, a professional firm that really relies on collaboration, not just internally, but with our, with our clients, um, and also from, uh, you know, a, a, someone who provides professional services to these very large entities where discussions are, are, are key, right? Collaboration, innovation, and sort of these, these brainstorming activities have been affected by this. Um, I think the best we can do is distill these down to, to what we do know, right? What, what do we know? What do we recognize as far as behaviors go? Uh, because I don't think we're, we're flying blind here. Uh, again, we... There are companies and there are entities out there that have already been remote and been very successful. You've got these international teams of, of software developers that are collaborating across from Pakistan to South Africa to Chicago and doing so very, very well. So my thing is, how do we, A, draw a distinction between the reality of the now versus uh, what may happen in the future, but at the same time, look at things that are working now draw parallels to things that we know have been working for 10 years in some of these other industries and in some of these other work groups and draw those lessons forward. For us, what that's really been and what's been working for us and for our clients is making sure that we have deliberate touch points. And what I mean by that is not arbitrary meetings, right? It's very easy to stand up a, 
a Zoom every morning at 8 a.m. And then everyone just kind of sits down and you've got the 2D images and people take turns giving status reports. Uh, I'm not saying there's not value to that and, and, and certainly not trying to be offensive to folks who, who do rely on that model. But what we try to do is make sure that we have very purpose-centric touch points wherein we have a problem and we are very deliberately assembling a group of people to have a discussion about that problem. And really, what does that do? That, that not only makes sure that we have inclusivity, right? You don't have someone who's an island out there that feels really disconnected and not engaged, uh, that's out of, uh, out of the sight of the boss, right? Normally I'd be sitting here in the next office, uh, now I can't see you. I never want someone to feel like they're, they're that disconnected. So when we have an activity like this and we say, look, we're very deliberately getting together, this is what we're brainstorming. This is why you're all here, right? It's very similar to, to Brett's generous introductions uh, of us at the beginning, saying, look, we, we understand what our role is. We understand what our expertise is. We understand why we're sitting amongst these colleagues and we have really good conversations with a common goal to solve a problem. Uh, I'm not saying that's the be all end all, that's, but that I think is far more valuable to a firm like ours um, and, and our client base than these arbitrary meetings, right? Well, Stephen, let me interject with, with actually, I think something you said uh, really touched on one of the questions we, or the first question we've gotten from the, one of the audience members that, you know, many organizations, I'm gonna try to summarize and read it, uh, establishing these go to back to work strategies based on individual and preferences of the employees, giving them the chance to either work remotely or coming into the office. Um, now this brings into an interesting question of, if you choose to stay home and you're out of sight, out of mind of the manager, how do you basically demonstrate you're still being effective and is not having clear standards or expectations um, set by the organization, potentially creating more stress for employees who may choose to stay at home, but fear that they're gonna be out of sight, out of mind of their, of their manager or their supervisor. So maybe like 30 seconds on that and we'll try to get to the next, uh, our next topics. Well, I'm, I'm certainly curious to see how Twitter's going to, uh to pull that off, um, it, yeah. it was very interesting news. And yeah. if anything, you know, had my attention immediately. Uh, so for us, I think, again, it, it, I know this is a non-answer. We fall back on the culture we've already built. Um, and within that culture, I think everybody understands their value, what they bring to the table. They understand that you don't have to be seen to be recognized. Um, and a lot of times the product of your work, you know, it speaks for itself and, and is very closely tied to you and, and your teammates as you deliver. Um, I think preserving that has been key for us, right? We know that everyone understands why they're on the call. We don't arbitrarily say, okay, everybody join. This is an all hands meeting. Everybody understands that if you are connecting to a call, this is why, this is why your voice is important. And this is what the expected outcome is or what the desired outcome is. Um, so I think, again, kind of falling back on that, understanding your role and communicating that, that really goes hand in hand with being an individual and, and being able to identify the best forum for your inputs. Carlos, you had a point? Or well, I, I, yeah, I think as long as we, whether it's a meeting or work on a project, it's about staying outcomes focused. We don't have a meeting unless we've identified a, a tangible outcome we want to produce. And we shouldn't. And as, as an employee, your boss may not see you. What's, what matters is that you produce what you, what you committed to produce, whether that's a report or a slide deck or a, an analysis of some data. Um, and for some people, I'm sure that's difficult. They like to get the recognition for the process. But in this environment, it's a reminder that what matters is what, and I'm not saying the how doesn't matter. How we do things really does matter, right? But it, it, we have to give people the space to get things done the way they know best how to get them done. And when they produce the result, affirm, acknowledge, recognize. I'd, um, I'd like to offer a friendly amendment to this, though. Yeah, please. Because the, you know, there is a part of the, especially when we think about really cre serious creative work, right? If we have a clear task, then a meeting, yeah, absolutely. This is our task. Here's what we're here to do. Let's make sure we do that, right? But there's... Not all tasks are the same and uh, not all, you know, sometimes the, the process and the wandering is a part of what makes the magic happen. So again, I do a lot of research on creativity and know a lot about how teams create. And it's funny because there is something in the wandering that brings out, I mean, this is my problem with the water cooler. Oh, we had a water cooler idea and suddenly poof, we had this great new thing. You know what, if you don't develop that, it's not going anywhere. 
right? Nothing is an idea that came out perfectly the first time. So when we have uh, the capacity, like if we can understand that maybe these virtual meetings have a really kind of prescribed process or a prescribed set of things which they can work at, and we actually need to allow other kinds of processes to take place or better find other media, because I think that's also the challenge, right? Um, I think we can solve a problem remotely. Sometimes getting into the real nitty gritty is challenging, coming up with something creative because you're not feeding off of each other. I mean, the best analogy I could have is like, I could pick up one of my guitars back there and start playing and you could play too, like, but I don't think we'd get the chemistry. Like that requires something a lot more subtle. The flip side of that though is I think one of the interesting things about this new medium and is that there is a greater capacity for multi-channel communication. And what I mean is that, so this is Stephen, you inspired this when you were talking about like how sometimes people, you know, are sort of off in the corner in a meeting and others are really sort of taking a center stage. That's true in classrooms too. Now, as I teach online, you see a lot of the people who are more quiet using the chat function. So mm -hmm. you literally have like multiple communications going at the same time, but they're relevant to each other. They're not fighting over each other and they're not distracting. And that to me is an interesting, again, an interesting expansion of how we do our work and almost suggest that if we were in a room together, maybe we should also be online, though we are in the room together. You know, um, there's a lot of, there's, and those are very specific things that will come from looking more deeply into what we're doing, how we're doing it, and what it is affecting. And I think that's really, like, again, asking those questions. They'll sound a bit like a broken record, but that is, that's how we learn those things, and that's how we advance. I am a prodigious <laughs> chat chatter during our faculty meetings that are now virtual. I, it's like a great time to send people messages. <laughs> Must not um, comment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I think that's great. And I, and I just want to hit one point and then we'll, we'll move on. You know, um, my first boss, my first like real boss, true mentor, uh, was the former executive vice president at Panasonic. And I remember I asked him at one point, what was the difference between, what's the real difference between a Japanese organization and how they do new product development in the U.S.? And I, Matt, you said something about idea and ideation. And he described it that in Japan, they will spend significantly more time in ideation than he felt like American firms. That American firms were more quick to, to put an idea to market, where the Japanese would spend you know, four or five to 10 times longer trying to work out that idea and get every kink out of it before they moved on. I think how you do that now in virtual, where you're so efficient, is kind of interesting. Um, I want to move on to another area that... You know, I, I know it's something that, you know, as people who lead teams and lead organizations, I want to talk about organizational culture that, you know, now we've, we've removed the physical office and we're, as we move more to a remote environment, and Stephen, most of your, your workers are remote or they are on site at a client, you don't have a physical space, that the idea of corporate culture. And so, Matt, I wonder if you could start us off and we'll go with there, but the idea of threats to corporate culture right here, right now with this and how an organization can maintain its identity. Um, kind of from a theory perspective, we'll, we'll ask kind of Carlos and Steven to jump in. Well, you know, so corporate, corporate culture has inertia. And this is actually one of the other things about the idea of going back to the office and sort of seeing what sticks. We forget that the office is a system and that system has feedback in it, which keeps things the way they are. So my belief would be if we go back and we just sort of let it happen, we'll slide back right back to what we're used to doing. Right, something will have to sort of change in the structure to get the change to sort of take. Um, so again, uh, if we talked about what, what would you do to sort of, now that we've been kind of disrupted and we need to resettle, is there anything we can kind of move around that we can improve, right? Um, so actually, I, I, not to subvert your role, but you know, uh, we have a comment that says, you know, this person is going to come back to uh, a new company after, you know, a three month lockdown and she's sort of going to be settling in while they settle in at the same time. That's actually a perfect opportunity because you don't have to break things to, to make change, right? You don't have to like get people to move out of their, you know, sort of calcified position. It's fluid already. So we can kind of help and settle it, but we, it requires being mindful of it and sort of being aware of it. Culture is way more often assumed than discussed. 
And so unless people are saying, hey, I noticed we do this. Do we have to do that? Maybe we could do it this way instead. You know, starting to develop those, those habits, changing of habits. Like I said, change the structure, reset the structure, carry forward, right? That's, that's, how, that's how culture, I think, changes effectively as opposed to reactively. Right. Uh, so kind of jumping off of that, um, you know, we, we joke a lot about the, the, the social distancing and, and all these measures causing a breakdown of the social norm and acceptable standards. And, you know, certainly there's been a shift in the professional norm. And in case in point, when I first started having these Zooms uh, internally, I still dressed up. You know, I'm used to going into a federal building and having a, a suit and tie. I didn't quite have the jacket on, still had a shirt and tie. Uh, fast forward to yesterday, I, I have a meeting. I'm in my usual at-home ball cap, uh, t-shirt, and sweatpants. Now, today I put on a, a shirt for uh, out of respect for my, my colleagues uh, on the channel. Uh, but again, I, I think we're very much about iteration. And that was a poor example. But the point being that you start to discover what is actually important and what have you just been doing because that's been the norm, right? Uh, it's the norm to put on this shirt uh, and, and to, to comb your hair, I guess, uh, for an internal meeting. I'm not saying don't do those things, uh, but we start to recognize that, okay, well, in the worst, in the worst sense, it's what can I get away with, right? And, and someone's not going to call me out on it. But from a managerial standpoint, I'm looking down at the, the culture of my company, um, and I'm looking at these emergent behaviors and sort of the ways my employees adapt, things that they put off to the side and how that affects their performance. Um, how various channels of communication work, right? Uh, culture is a huge thing for us. And, and to your point, Matt, uh, we have multiple channels uh, by which we can uh, make our voices heard. So Brett's actually experienced this. Uh, when we first pick up a problem, we have a big company call. You're not forced to be on that call, but we encourage everyone, whether or not they're part of that contract or problem, to jump in on the call, listen to the problem, and, and everyone just sort of collectively brainstorms. And yes, that's a, a little bit of a forced and organized process, but then that's followed up by having multiple channels. We have a hashtag brainstorm, brainstorm channel um, for existing projects. We have a, a forum by which a given employee can hear about a problem and just kind of pitch it to the company, say, what do you think about this? Does anyone have any ideas? Is this something that's uh, a pro possibly a, a viable service or product idea? Should we discuss it? Um, I have an idea that, you know, I read this article on the news, I'm going to post it to this other channel and then invite conversation. That's gone very, very well. Um, and so during this time, I think what we're doing is we're really iterating through, okay, now that we're not in an office place. Uh, now, granted, we, as Brett said, most of us have been remote uh, lately, but there's also times that we come together in an office space because we see the value of that. Having been deprived of that, we're looking at what channels have been working, what's keeping people engaged. We're noticing that certain employees, to your point, speak up in certain forums where they would be, you know, distance and others. And from a managerial standpoint, we're trying to recognize that and make those forums better, uh, make the employees more aware of those forums and the, the power of those forums. Uh, very actively reaching out to folks and saying, hey, look, we, we actually noticed that you had some great ideas the other day on the Brainstorm channel. Um, is there anything we can do to help you? develop that, right? Or, or do, you, do you want us to connect you with some folks who may have some expertise to help you develop that idea? So I think what we're doing is we're sort of, we're iterating our way to sort of that ideal um, evolution of culture, right? Uh, amidst all of this. Carlos, let me jump to you and, and ask you that point. So we are seeing a lot of organizations right now trying to do, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say iterations or, or forced in, engagements, whether it's kind of the happy hours, the, the social events. Um, are, you know, are those things, I mean, you're trying to maintain some element of, of social structure and culture. Do you see a lot of value to those? Well, I do think that any, in much of the way Stephen was talking about it, be intentional about, if you want something, be intentional about it, right? Mm -hmm. Try some things, experiment, learn from those experiments, let go of what doesn't work, apply what does. Culture is persistent. Uh, often difficult to perceive, uh, hard to change. I, um, I've, I've never been, so in my career as an organization development consultant, I've never really savored culture change projects. 
Because what I found is, in more cases than not, the culture kills off the culture change project. <laughs> the, cult, the, the, the senior leaders have embodied this culture. It's, it's in people's DNA. And so they, we don't really want to do that. We wouldn't want to try this over here. That wouldn't work. So I, 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 I'm very careful about talking about culture because, and it's probably me, right? I'm probably just a lousy culture change consultant. The others may be better at it than I am. I do think that little gestures are not culture changing necessarily, right? If a little gesture, it's like the butterfly flapping its wings. I don't ever remember this analogy perfectly. A butterfly flaps its wings in Indonesia and there's a, a hurricane off the coast of Brazil, something like that. That's probably impossible meteorologically, but you get the point. Sometimes something like that happens, right? Uh, but it's, it's so hard to know that that little luncheon you hold that suddenly takes off and starts to become a feature of the culture. It's almost accidental in my experience, right? Um, it's a little bit like what Stephen was talking about. You try something small and see what happens. If it doesn't work, you move on. I just think culture is such a big topic and little tweaks to it often don't work. Um, uh, I, I, I think this is this pandemic we're living through will shake up cultures in all kinds of ways. To the point Matt was making earlier, this is a time to ask ourselves, wait, it, it, was that the best way to be doing things? The Mars open office, for example, which was, as you talked about earlier, Brett, right? A feature of the Mars culture since the 1930s. Um, you have to stop and ask yourself, okay, what are we learning about how that affects how we work, how we lead, our policies, our practices? This is the, such a great time to do that. Uh, so I, I, I think the pandemic throws the culture into question and should. I think playing, little, playing at the edges isn't really smart, but I think making a few strategic choices here and there and seeing how they work, iterating, letting go of and adopting what works, can be good. I don't know if it answers your question, Brett, but it's, it's such a massive topic and one that I have to admit I, I often get nervous around. No, it is. I, I thought it was interesting. I have family members who work at a couple different uh, big apparel companies in the Pacific Northwest. You know, I had four letter words that, you know, I, I won't name the company, um, but you can kind of, you know, Portland, Oregon started with running. Um, they, but it was interesting that, you know, we were having conversations and just like, hey, you know, are your, is your company going to allow you to start doing more telework? And like, oh, no, no, they're wanting us back, like, now. Um, and I thought it was, you know, interesting of the, the tech companies are moving forward, which is kind of more their culture. But the culture of those apparel companies is the campus feel you get when you're there. Because it's, you know, those buildings, everything is about the on-site uh, environment that, that exists. And that's their culture. Um, and, you know, the pandemic is challenging that. And they're not going to doesn't seem like they're going to let it go. Um, well, let's come back. Sorry, Brett, can I, can I just one quick last thing to really, like, I really did like the idea what Carla said about that. The nipping at the margins is very difficult for something with inertia. Think of, you know, in, at GMU, a bunch of us had to move off campus, right? And, and it revitalized a lot of the sort of camaraderie amongst all of us who were in our new building. And in a way that, you know, we had been trying to do for a while anyway, right? right? And so, again, th like, this is, that is the opportunity of this big shakeup, right, to really then sort of, now that everything's destabilized, right, maybe those marginal pieces can rebuild. Um, that's because, yeah, I, I think you're right. Like I said, little, little things, we had been trying for a while, and then that big thing happened, and a lot more happened, you know? I'm not doing a great job with my time management for this. So I want to get us to the last one. And, and as we, uh, you guys kind of, some, some, some tidbits, some tricks, some things that you see in research. And this goes to actually one of the comments in the chat that, you know, there is this difference, I think, between productivity for people who have small children in the house who may not have somebody who can help them uh, manage those children. And so what we've had, and we talked about this at length on the podcast, we've had, we've lost other places to escape and to go to. We're now stuck at home with our, with our family, with our children, and finding boundaries, setting boundaries, finding ways to compartmentalize your life is incredibly difficult right now. And so 
how I mean, what is just very let's say very quickly in your guys's words a couple sentences a paragraph what is it you know some of the ideas of how you balance how you get this work life balance and maintain productivity with healthy mental health perspectives oh healthy i was good till you got there but okay <laughs> let the other ones go for it you know what i don't have small kids at home my kids are grown and out having kids of their own so i will defer to Stephen and and Matt on this sounds like you guys have young ones and, and maybe I can offer something of value here. So kids actually help me. If you think about it, um, one thing I've experienced is very early on, I lost my social cues. I lost, I lost my, my beloved coworkers coming up and saying, hey, let's go downstairs and get a coffee, which was a welcome break to my day. And there's usually a timing to it. It usually happens about the same time of day. So A, I look forward to it. And I, I actually structure some of my work around it. Knowing that, hey, most likely at 10, 15, someone's going to come by and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get up and get some coffee. Again, there's a break at lunch. And, and so it helps me to segment my day. When I lost that, I found I was working from 6 a.m. till 1 p.m. and not realizing how much time went by. And that doesn't necessarily translate to better productivity either. It, it's just immersion, right? Uh, if anything, I feel... Uh, and, and Matt, I'm not sure if there's some academic basis to this, but I feel like my creativity, if anything, was stifled because I didn't have that mental break to step away from a problem. So Absolutely. the kids actually helped me. Uh, the kids forced me to break out of this sort of uh, this, this tunnel vision and get up. Um, now, but moving forward, I, I have to think that as things return to normal and the possibility of meeting coworker at Starbucks, even when you're remote, or going out and, and getting lunch from somewhere other than your own kitchen, things like that will also help, right? Not this current state of things isn't gonna be preserved 100%. Uh, but I would say if you are not getting up, and you don't have the benefit of a kid uh, running in the door, um, definitely break up your day, right? Put, those, put a timer on your phone, get some water, get up and stand up and walk around. Because I, I, I'm not saying this is true for everyone, but I myself, I feel my creativity uh, suffers if I just am engrossed in the task uninterrupted uh, for too long a period. You know, and um, I definitely think, uh, well, first of all, there is actually some work on the, like, yeah, productivity definitely peaks. So what you're sensing is, has been verified, you know, in, in terms of being like, you just need a break. But going back to the, how to manage kids, uh, I've, uh, the only thing I've learned about that is that, like I said, teaching college doesn't give you any legitimacy teaching your kid anything. Um, but, uh, but what I will say is maybe this is actually something we bring back to the office. So we've all kind of had to get used to the fact that I was on the phone with, I was in an interview the other day and the person had to stop to yell at their kid to get the dog out of the room. And I, you know, we all kind of laughed because we all understand that this is the world we're in. And it's a more humane way to work. So, you know, all of us who work in offices also have times when, you know, oh my God, my kid's sick, I gotta pick him up, my wife can't do that, right? Like, like we're, we're like family intrudes. And then Mason, I say, has been pretty cool because people will bring their kids to the office and it's not a big deal, right? Um, maybe that's the right way to approach it, right? Obviously, you don't wanna be like, hey, I'm gonna bring my, you know, you know, daughter in so that you can watch her, but, you know, if we all went back to work and every once in a while when somebody had to come in with their kid and they said, Hey, sit there while I finish this. Right. Maybe that's not so bad. Maybe that is a, that's adaptive. Right. And so that they don't have to make excuses for why they can't work or they don't feel bad that like, you know, like it, it could be, it, this can show us that work can even get done with the kids running around. Right. So like I said, we could broaden the way we think. No, that's great. I, I think the idea, and to build off both of your point, both, I and mean, we've had that relaxation of kind of those rigid boundaries, and then also to, to create time in your life, uh, you know, create a schedule and keep to it. I know that's, um, I'm finding, you know, it, it took a couple of weeks, but I was able to finally get into a rhythm. Um, and then it just kind of old hat. Uh, I think it you, creates empathy too, right? To some degree. Uh, a lot of times we it, it, think it, rewind about six months and you hear someone yelling in the background uh, on your coworker's phone, right? When you're on teleconference, I think a lot of people at that time, I know firsthand, some people are, are very intolerant of that. Um, and they're not very um, sympathetic. And I think fast forwarding to now, by no means, this is a rule, but I, I notice that people are a lot more understanding. It becomes more of a humorous kind of thing. 
Um, so I, I don't know what the implications of that are, but. Right. Uh, so this is our, our last question. And this is our, our, our chance to kind of, I don't want to say prognosticate. We know that that's not something we, we want to do. But um, there's been there's been a lot of, obviously a lot of change, a lot of corporate uh, activities that have gone through quite a bit of transformation for this. And there's going to be a lot of organizational design experts saying, what do we carry forward from this? What did we learn how to do that we didn't know we could do? But I, I want to flip it around and say, what have we learned to do in this period right now that we should not as organizational uh, scholars, as leaders, as executives carry forward in the organization? Well, I we're learning how to do this remote working thing really well. And I have a hunch that because we are as a species uh, fundamentally social, I, I think, I think we don't want to carry forward. I, I, what was, it was the, uh, the Twitter announcement that 5,000 people could work from home for the rest of their lives. Right. Um, different kind of tech environment, but for places like Mars and IBM and other places where I've worked, I think the office comes back and I, I don't want to assume that technology can replace person to person social contact, which I think we need as human beings. I, there's a lot we can do remotely, absolutely. And I don't want to uh, minimize that in any way. But I think we should not make assumptions about how much of how much of our working lives we can do uh, via technology? I would not want us to carry it for it as the ultimate lesson. Wow, we could do all this without ever being in the same room together. I think that would be a shame. Yeah. Uh, so on the flip side of that, one thing I would I would advise, is especially to our, our federal government and, and other entities that are a little more traditional or started out a little more traditional, we're kind of carried into this. I would say absolutely carry forward what you've learned though, right? Um, yeah. it, there, there've been a lot of uh, inflexible workplaces where telework really is something that that's useful. It's a useful option for flexibility, for recruiting, uh, things like that. So uh, certainly do not, I wouldn't carry over any data from the now and use that to, to gauge productivity or, or, or think that mm. these things will indefinitely work or su are sustainable, but definitely you, you've had the benefit now of, having a, a little bit of a sample of, of how your folks can work with that specific type of work uh, in this type of environment, don't, don't let it go to waste, right? Uh, even if it's just sitting down and examining what worked and what didn't work, uh, let's make sure that we, we, we take our lessons learned, right? And, and really benefit as individual organizations so that now that we've explored, we can, we can integrate those things that, that we feel may work and, and certainly explore um, and, and not let this go to waste. Good point. I would say um, we should stop thinking of work as merely about productivity. I mean, that may sound a little odd, right? Because mm -hmm. the purpose of work is industry. But the fact of the matter is that work does a lot for people's sense of identity, for their sort of balance, for like, I mean, again, this is sort of riffing on where Carlos started. You know, they're like, I am not looking forward to going back to the office for any reason relating to productivity merely because this job is a lot less fun when I do it this way. Right. And I, again, I can teach this way. I don't, but like, I don't want to, right. I, the, what I've always been saying is, you know, you can, you can watch a concert on TV or you can go to the concert, you know, and one is a poor substitute for the other, right. That's different from listening to a record, right. Which maybe it's fine to do at home. So, if we can understand that work is has these other social, personal values to it, maybe the office is a place really to enhance that, right? We have huge problems nowadays with turnover, with people changing jobs, with not being committed. You know, uh, you know, I sort of remember the 80s when all that happened, when they were like, you're just a cog. It's like, okay, then in the 90s when the market's good, I'll see you later, right? You know, maybe there's a way to sort of reverse that and think, no, I'm, I'm staying here because I want to stay here because I like doing this, right? And because I think that maybe that was something, again, if we can stop seeing it just in the productivity numbers, maybe we can expand. And ironically, that would make productivity greater. What do you think, Brett? No, that's great. Sorry, I was, I was late <laughs> on hitting my unmute. Um, 
We are at the top of the hour. Um, I want to thank the, the panelists. Um, to the audience members, thank you for, for joining. Uh, if you do have any kind of last minute questions, um, I'm sure you know, they, they would be happy or hopefully you know, to, to answer them in the next little bit. We've got entertained by Matt's cat now in the background. Um, so uh, I just want to thank all of you for coming. If you have any kind of last minute points, please bring them up. Um, also, just a, one more time, a reminder, we have some great upcoming content uh, around professional skills development, tax implications, the physical workspace that's going to change. Uh, I encourage you to listen to the podcast that Matt and Carlos and I did. You can find that on the Mason Means Business podcast. Uh, there's other great content there. We're going to be continuing to, to produce stuff. Uh, in the coming weeks. Um, and also, if you have ideas, suggestions, thoughts on our uh, summer master series, please uh, send me a message. If you look, uh, you can email me bjosephs at gmu.edu. I uh, would really appreciate it. Uh, let's see if there are any questions uh, or any more comments. It could be uh, other people. I, I don't see any right now. So just want to thank any final kind of lasting points from Carlos, Matt, Stephen before we end up. No, thanks for the opportunity and the great conversation. Good meeting you, Stephen. And thanks, Matt. As always, really rich discussion. Yeah, Stephen, very nice to meet you. Carlos, good seeing you again. And uh, Brett, thanks for this. This is, uh, this is cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely thank you from my end as well. Um, I have a new book that I want to buy and read and some research that I <laughs> would like to look into on Matt's side. So I appreciate it. Yeah, two from Carlos. Lessons from Mars and uh, mm -hmm. virtual teams. You're so. embarrassing me, Brett. Stop it. This is where I actually I got to grab my craft of creativity and shove that in the screen. That's it, exactly. Like, I don't know. Damn why, it! I don't know why <laughs> I'm not a marketer, Brad. You're you're supposed to you do that stuff. Come on. Now. <laughs> right. um, got, uh, gentlemen, as always, uh, it's great to see you. I'm sure we will be talking because we seem to talk a lot, um, and so we'll look forward to doing more of these. Um, more yeah. content from them. Uh, and for everyone, uh, stay safe out there, and we will see you all uh, hopefully next week at the next webinar. All right. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.